case, um, sorry, not the petitioner, the respondent in the case, Mr. Eric Brunetti, uh, who is the founder of the company who has applied for the trademark at issue today. Not mentioning that company by name right now. Um, so he will be with us, um, as will his lawyer, Mr. John Summer, um, who uh, uh, has represented him throughout this litigation. Um, and he um, ha handles IP for a limited number of clients. Um, previously, uh, he headed the IP team at the Los Angeles office of Baker and Hostedler. Um, next in line, we will have Ted Davis. Um, Ted Davis offered the amicus brief for the AIPLA in support of neither party. Yay. I've already introduced you. Um, um, Mr. Davis is a partner at Kilpatrick, Townsend, and Stockton, um, and he divides his practice between domestic and international litigation and client counseling in the fields of trademark, copyright, false advertising, and unfair competition law and has particular experience in trade dress and gray market disputes. Uh, next, we will have uh, Mr. Caleb Trotter, um, who author authored an amicus uh, brief in, uh, on behalf of the Pacific Legal Foundation in support of respondent. Um, Mr. Trotter uh, primarily litigates cases involving economic liberty, the First Amendment, and equality under law at the Pacific Legal Foundation. Um, next, we have Ilya Shapiro, uh, who off authored an amicus brief for the Cato Institute DKT Liberty Project in support of respondent. Um, Mr. Shapiro is the director of the Robert... Andy Juror. And Nadine Strawson, just a group of uh, scandalous individuals and organizations. <laughs> okay, that, that sounds interesting. We'll hear more about that. Um, uh, Mr. Shapiro is the author, is the co-author of Religious Liberties for Corporations, Hobby Lobby, the Affordable Care Act, and the Constitution, and he, and he is the editor of the 11 volumes of the Cato Supreme Court Review. Um, next, we will have uh, Jeremy Fagelson, uh, Fagelson, sorry, Fagelson, um, okay. who authored an amicus brief on behalf of the International Trademark Association in support of respondent. Um, he is a litigation partner and co-chair of the firm's cybersecurity and data privacy practice and a member of Deba Voice and Plimpton's IP and media group. Uh, and his practice includes litigation and counseling on uh, cybersecurity, data privacy, trademark, right of publicity, false advertising, copyright, and defamation matters. And then finally, um, joining us shortly, um, will be um, Professor Megan Carpenter, who is an IP professor and the dean of the University of New Hampshire Law School, um, who's written in the area. Um, so as you can see, a wonderful lineup of um, experts who I think all have strong opinions on these issues and have, uh, will have interesting comments for us. Is Mr. Brunetti coming? Yeah, he's here on campus. Oh, darn. <laughs> that could take an hour on this campus. Yeah, and, and hopefully he's on this campus and not on the main campus. Uh, okay. So um, let's see, where to begin? Um, maybe we should begin, and, and I will like to do no talking, um, just the, I'll just ask the hard questions, but maybe we should begin with, begin with a bit of background. When Mr. Brunetti comes, I'd like to ask him about uh, his experience um, uh, in, you know, in, in the matter of applying for and um, pursuing this trademark. Um, but until then, um, maybe we should back up and have someone explain um, maybe, Mr. Davis, you could explain um, what, uh, what Section 2 of the Trademark Act does. Well, Section 2 of the Lanham Act is the, is, the, is the statute that sets forth the reasons why an examining attorney within the Patent and Trademark Office may, on his or her own initiative, refuse registration to a particular mark. Um, it leads off by saying that no mark shall be denied registration because of its nature and accept, and then it goes on to list uh, some various, various categories of marks that are ineligible for registration because of their nature, and those are found in sections 2A through section 2E. Um, some of these prohibitions are absolute in nature. You can't get around them. 
There are others that you can get around by showing that your mark has acquired distinctiveness or secondary meaning. And there's one that you can get around a prohibition on the registration of somebody else's personal name. You can get around that if you secure that party's written consent. Um, then there are a couple of other causes of action that you can assert against, uh, you can assert in a challenge against an existing registration or an application in an opposition or cancellation action. Those are the grants of likelihood of dilution by tarnishment, likelihood of dilution by blurring, um, but those cannot be asserted by an examiner. Great. Um, and maybe I'll go to my other um, trademark lawyer here, Mr. Uh, Fagelson. Could you explain the provisions at issue in this case, or the provision at issue in this case? Uh, sure. The uh, provision at issue in this case, it's a subset of what Ted was saying. It's the uh, 2A uh, language, which prevents the uh, uh, or allows an examiner to deny uh, registration on the grounds that uh, a mark is uh, immoral or scandalous. Uh, I'll note, just jumping ahead to the discussion of the argument, the argument seemed to focus exclusively, I thought, on the word scandalous this morning and not the word immoral, which is kind of interesting. Um, and. Uh, if we're looking for sort of you know, depth or unpacking on those words, the statute really doesn't give us anything. That's that's literally what it says, and there is um, guidance from the trademark office uh, over the years, which, in the view of uh, my client, the International Trademark Association, amounts to sort of a useless word salad. Um, so maybe I'll just stop there. Good. Um, so um, before we get to this case, maybe um, we should have a. a just a short summary, maybe, of the TAM case. Mr. Shapiro, would you? Sure. For that um, two years ago, the Supreme Court. Two years ago, the Supreme Court uh, decided a case involving a related provision of the Lanham Act uh, that uh, prohibited registration of disparaging trademarks. Uh, typically, that meant disparaging of uh, ethnic and racial groups, uh, certain other things. This case was brought by a group of Asian American rock musicians, the Slants. The Slants is a, a derogatory term for, for Asians, and, uh, but they were taking it back. Uh, and yet they were denied uh, this registration. And uh, around the same time was the uh, Redskins, the Washington Redskins litigation. Uh, they, they were, they, they were deregistered, uh, their, their trademarks. So anyway, uh, the Supreme Court ended up unanimously striking down the disparaging provision, uh, trademark provision. Uh, in, Tam, in Mattel versus Tam. Uh, and so the conventional wisdom going into this case, well, this is kind of cleanup duty. I guess it's going to go the exact same way. The reasoning is the exact same. You know, what's disparaging? What's scandalous? It's, you know, leave it to the market or it's not the government's words anyway. That was sort of the conventional wisdom going into this litigation. And until it got to the Supreme Court, well, until this morning's argument, um, uh, I, the, the procedure was basically the same. The federal circuit struck it down and the government appealed. Right. Okay. So now let's, let's get to the, the case of the day. Um, and maybe I could start with you, Mr. Brunetti. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Sorry you had trouble finding us. <laughs> We're delighted to have you. How do you feel uh, being in a room of lawyers and soon-to-be lawyers? Uh, I'm kind of used to it, actually. <laughs> <laughs> So, Mr. Brunetti, I just would be interested to know, um, you know, uh, there was a lot of discussion in the argument today that you heard um, about, you know, whether you have a registration or don't have a registration. You can still have a mark. You can still use a mark. You can still enforce a mark. Um, so why, I'm just interested if you would tell us why did you decide to pursue getting a mark and then why did you pursue it all the way up to the Supreme Court? Well, we, we have uh, quite a bit of counterfeits with my brand. It's, it's been more difficult to enforce a common law trademark than an actual trademark, uh, especially with uh, uh, groups like eBay, Amazon, um, uh, mainly online. It's, 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 it's extremely difficult to enforce it. And, it seems like the counterfeiters are doing better business than I am these days. So, interesting. <laughs> huh. And so the lawyer, the answer sounded very lawyerly. So I can tell you have spent a fair amount of time with trademark lawyers. Um, Not with trademark lawyers. On the other end. <laughs> <laughs> but when um, when you when you got the response from the trademark office saying that the that the application was denied, 
um, as being scandalous. And there was a provision in the act saying that scandalous marks could not be registered. Um, can you tell us about your thought process of challenging this provision, challenging the constitutionality? I, I've been trying to register my mark since since 1990. It's and it's been refused every time. And in 2011, John and I um, decided to try again. And I, I met John through working with another company. And John was looking over some of the the artwork that I was doing for this company to make sure that it wasn't infringing. And we just got to talking about my trademark, and then that's sort of how it took off. Um, so I, I, you know, it's just fascinating to have the client in the room. Um, I wonder how you felt um, in the courtroom today, where everybody was talking about your case, um, and you know, did you did you feel entirely connected to it, or did sometimes? I know I talked to Simon Tam after the Tam case, and and he said that he often felt um, like they were talking about something that wasn't at all his lived experience. Yeah, that's exactly what it felt like. Yeah. Very surreal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, Mr. Summer, um, can you tell us about why you were drawn to this case and why you've in invested the time and effort in it? Well, I'll, I'll talk about several different things. The first thing for all you students, listen to your professors. And the reason is I took Mel Nimmer for copyright uh, now 38 years ago, I think. And he talked about and mentioned passing this case about this guy he represented, wore a jacket into the courthouse. And I always remember that, and I thought it was an interesting case. And now it turns out to be sort of relevant. Because when this actually came up, that was like, oh, why isn't that binding? To sort of give you some background, um, before, my, before Eric and I met, he'd filed for the mark and got refused. I think he actually forgot about that at one time. And then in 2011, you know, I'm just search, search, searching the database every now and then. I saw someone else had uh, filed for uh, FUCT. Uh, I think he's actually like a retired lawyer in North Carolina. It, it made no sense. So I said, basically, you know, you can't get it registered because we got prior rights. And all I had to do is write a letter to the PTO, and it's going to get refused. So maybe we want you to assign it to the real owner. I was actually a little bit worried the government might attack the assignment because as you, who knows about the rule about assigning ITUs? Okay. <laughs> All right. Anyway, you have, there's a certain way you have to do it because otherwise it's invalid. So um, we did it. And I think, you know, because I actually came back, because uh, my other thing is, is preparation. And I came back uh, two months ago to do sort of do a dry run and see the Supreme Court. And, um, oh, gosh, where was I going on that? Um, um, Anyway, um, so um, I think most of the cases get here. Well, like with the, uh, the return mail, that guy didn't want to be before the Supreme Court. I don't think Eric wanted to be before the, be the Supreme Court. I think you were sort of, you were sort of shocked when you were on CNN. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think that's what he bought into. And so like that poor guy from return mail is like, all I wanted is to get some money for my patent. So I think a lot of cases get to the Supreme Court by accident. In this case, certainly got there by accident. I had no idea that we'd get here. Because when I started off, I said, Eric, you know, we'll get the trademark. You know, maybe there's a 1% chance we can get it registered, maybe 5% chance. I was hoping that, you know, maybe, you know, the, the government didn't have the right kind of evidence. I was hoping to knock out the Urban Dictionary and therefore say there's no evidence. So that was my only hope. And yeah, I thought there might be a constitutional argument, but you know the law was absolutely clear that that had no uh, merit. So, and we sort of just uh, it went step after step after step, and I still have to give thanks to my boss because I also have another job, and besides representing Eric, although over the last six months I think it's the <laughs> other way around, because um, I literally I think I spent about a third of my time in the last six months working on this case. Um, so uh, you just sort of go from one step to another step. And then you end up here. So uh, that's enough for now. I have other interesting things, but. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> um, OK, so um, uh, Professor Carpenter, you just joined us, Dean Carpenter. Um, so one question I'd like, I'd like to ask you all, but I'll, but I'll ask you, um, is that a couple of people have alluded to this, the granting of cert in this case, given the fact that we just had the TAM decision two years ago, um, were you surprised that the Supreme Court granted cert in this case? I was a little surprised, but I, I think that the TAM decision itself almost begged for cert in this case, because I think you know, the TAM decision, when you're looking at the opinion, it was reminiscent of a lot of the problematic 
TTAB decisions over time that, that seem to conflate everything in the spectrum of offensive trademarks. And so, you know, I was hoping that from the TAM decision, we would start to see a parsing out of what is disparaging from what is uh, scandalous or immoral. But then you see this language of offensive trademarks, and it was unclear to me, does offensive trademarks, or it, does that just refer to disparaging trademarks, or does that also refer to the scandalous and immoral um, branch? And so I think that for me, initially, I thought, you know, this is going to resolve everything. Then reading the opinion, I thought, wait a second, this calls absolutely for a resolution to the question of what we do about scandalous trademarks. Okay, any other views on that, the granting of cert? Well, I guess I'll just say, I thought there's no possibility cert would be granted, but then I talked to a law professor who says that every time a federal statute is held unconstitutional, even though the result is clear, the Supreme Court still grants cert. And Chief, the Chief Justice actually gave a speech about two months ago that he said that, in effect. Okay, so um, Mr. Trotter, we haven't heard from you. Um, so uh, I, we'll, we'll get to some of the, the, the big issues in the case, but um, one of these things that was left unresolved from TAM was the status of commercial speech um, and whether that was a category that still had work to do. And I know that was one of your chief interests in, in writing an amicus brief. Um, so can you tell us about, give us a little bit of background about that? Sure. So PLF, Pacific Legal Foundation, uh, we have an institutional interest in being involved in cases that kind of meld individual speech rights with um, the economic sphere. So anytime an entrepreneur, small business person is running into um, government red tape just in their pursuit of earning a living, these are the kind of cases that, that we have an interest in. I, I have no expertise in intellectual property aside from my intellectual property class, um, but we do a lot of uh, First Amendment work, so that's, that's kind of why I'm here. And we, we did the same brief in TAM essentially as we did in, in this case because, as you said, there is an um, idea that in tr the world of trademark that these are commercial speech because and this is in the commercial context. But the problem with that is there's a very specific definition for commercial speech that um, sometimes gets either confused or overlooked. And by, by conflating just this being in the commercial context with it maybe being commercial speech is problematic. And the primary problem is if it is commercial speech, then uh, the government has more leeway with regulating or even prohibiting the speech. And uh, in, in TAM, the, the Alito opinion did an analysis and said, while it's not deciding whether commercial speech, the so-called commercial speech doctrine applies or not, um, in that case, even the disparagement clause couldn't survive that. And so it said, we'll wait for another day to decide if commer the commercial speech doctrine applies in the trademark context. And so in this case was granted, but this is another opportunity. Justice Thomas has written um, many times throughout the years, as well as a, no a number of commentators kind of attacking the very idea of the commercial speech doctrine. Maybe we can get into that a little bit later. And so saw an opportunity to address that in this case. It didn't come up once in oral argument today, which didn't really surprise me. Um, but I think there are, based on some of the line of questioning from some of the justices today, we can see while it's kind of on the back burner in their minds, it's definitely still relevant to, to this case. Yeah, I think I heard commercial speech in some long passages by Justice Breyer, but I don't think there was actually a question there. Um, What's new? <laughs> okay, so I guess the, the question I really want to ask all of you, and maybe we can just go down, down, the, down the line, and I'll begin with Mr. Brunetti. Um, what, you know, <clears throat> I mean, some of the hallway conversation is it was a surprising argument. Um, so I'd, I'd be interested in what what you what you were surprised by today. Were you surprised by anything, Mr. Brunetti? I was I was surprised at a uh, uh, Ruth uh, Ginsburg. Is that her name? <laughs> uh, knew the brand actually. Did you knew hear? the brand? Yeah, yeah. She, she made specific references. She made to specific your references yeah. where I knew she actually researched it or 
is familiar with it. You should send her a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I just did an interview with GQ, and they recommended that. They yeah. Said, <laughs> yeah, because I, I just saw on Twitter, somebody sent her a shirt, and she sent a really lovely response. Well, she she got the, the, the national women's soccer team. That's what it was, yeah. yeah. Actually, I have to interrupt because one of the things that um, you always have to assume that the judges with the internet, the judges, especially the law clerks, will look at the website. And before we argued at the Federal Circuit, because also our theory has changed through these different appeals, and at the Federal Circuit the first time, we were arguing it doesn't relate to sex. It's not a bad word. And so I said, Eric, you know, the law clerks are going to look at your website. And we're arguing it doesn't relate to sex. And having the two-minute video of a naked woman riding a motorcycle across the desert might be contradictory to that theory. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not sex. <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe, maybe I'll leave the last word for you on, on the surprises. Um, Dean Carpenter? I was surprised. It was really exciting to hear all of the different branches of questioning, that, that um, and, and many of them surprised me. But I think the, th the single biggest thing that surprised me today was that everybody seemed to agree, including the attorney for the USPTO, that nobody really likes the statute. Um, and he was insisting that it was going to be narrowly construed. And obviously, the Brunetti team doesn't like the statute. And then the justices didn't seem to particularly like the statute either but that they wanted to kind of craft something in a way that would draw a line where the statute just doesn't draw the line. Um, so a lot of the lines of quest areas of questioning seem to be focused on things that weren't actually in the statute. And so if we're looking to see if it's facially unconstitutional, um, that didn't seem to be the question at hand. So that, did you? Did I agree. There's a lot in there that we can come back to, okay. yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, in terms of surprises, here the best summary I've heard of the argument so far, uh, somebody said to me, well, it comes down to this. Where do you cut off somebody's right to free speech versus what is best for society as a whole? The person who said that to me was the cab driver who picked me up at the Supreme Court this morning. Uh, I, I kid you not. He asked, he asked me, what are all these people doing here? I told them why, and that was his first reaction. Um, and it, I, I mention it not only because it's sort of hilarious, but um, he actually kind of nailed it. Um, it captured, I think, the tension that the justices felt, which is totally agree with Dean Carpenter. Nobody in that room liked the statute one bit. Uh, the government lawyer was like writhing, trying to find some way to defend it that, that was coherent. Um, <clears throat> but at the same time, uh, the justices clearly felt some discomfort with the idea that if they um, strike it down, it's a facial challenge. Um, <clears throat> Uh, then does that open the floodgates to some amount of registration uh, and further sort of penetration into society of language that um, you know we all might you know have reason to you know prefer not seeing certainly some members of the court feel that way uh, so you know it was uh, I think if there was one big surprise for me it was uh, the degree of discomfort that the court um, even some of the stronger First Amendment justices seemed to feel um, on that score um, and the fact that they're clearly they're, they're looking for a line they know the statute as written can't stand um, but they're looking for some way uh, to cut it down I think without um, not necessarily uh, open. I think it's a misplaced concern uh, in part because one of the things that came up in the argument was well, what's going to get registered and of course you know uh, curse swear was like any ordinary English word register as trademarks because you have to uh, build source identification uh, and just like it's tough to register you know to build up trademark identification in a word you know like Apple um, you know it can be very difficult to build up source identification in seven dirty words um, so I think this I think when the court sort of you know goes back to chambers and sits down to figure this out they're not going to find it all that difficult actually to strike it down in a way that addresses that discomfort. Wasn't it also surprising that they we managed to get through an entire hour without anyone saying any of the words that we were talking oh, about? Yeah. And I mean, there were times I was having a hard time following, like, okay, which, what word, you know, because people would say, we all know what we're talking about here. And I'm thinking, okay, which, 
what right. word are we thinking yeah. about in yeah. this context? Yeah. The, the best those formulation who was, was Malcolm Stewart, the, the deputy solicitor general. He, he called it the past participle of paradigmatic profanity. I don't know if he, <laughs> if he intended to have the alliteration, but that was memorable. <laughs> I'm going to trademark that. <laughs> Okay, Mr. Shapiro. Sure. Yeah, but the broader, I think, surprise is that uh, I was expecting the whole argument to be variations on the question, so how is this different from TAM? Yeah. So how is this different from TAM? Uh, and it turned out into this, you know, neither, nobody really seemed happy with either side winning it all, that is the statute's upheld or the statute's completely struck down, but then when are courts supposed to rewrite statutes unless it's Obamacare with, with Justice Roberts? And I don't know. Maybe, maybe this trademark provision will be a tax and upheld in that way. I, I don't know. But regardless, um, uh, at one point, Justice Kagan asked, uh, you know, what are we supposed to do here? Are we supposed to apply the statutory text? What the Federal Circuit, the appellate court uh, ruled? What, are we supposed to just rely on your, the, the government's, uh, assurances that they're not going to apply it broadly. That actually reminded me of the Citizens United argument, which, you know, the, the uh, argument started going pear-shaped for this same lawyer, for Malcolm Stewart, the deputy SG, uh, when he provided assurance as well, we actually wouldn't prosecute, you know, in these kind of instances, you know, book banning and whatnot. And anyway, that's the kind of the key moment that led to the re-argument and the broader opinion in Citizens United. But yeah, that was surprising. They're, they're, they're trying to juggle the facial versus, you know, there's the whole thing has to fall versus as applied. Uh, and, and also, is it, you know, typically when the whole statute is problematic, we just throw it out and let Congress redo it, but uh, maybe not here. Mr. Trotter? So the biggest surprise for me was Justice Alito's line of questioning. If you all recall, he's the one who authored the primary opinion in the TAM case and was joined by the chief as well as um, Justice Breyer and Thomas. And the reason I was surprised by his line of questioning and particularly his kind of retort to John was that TAM involved a, you know, a, an idea, an expression of an idea. And there's a line in TAM that says, quote, giving offense is a viewpoint. And so, I mean, it, I definitely agree that it seemed at multiple times the justices were you know, trying to find a way to kind of cabin out certain dirty words, even some of the more First Amendment friendly justices. And there does seem to be a bit of lack of comfort with kind of a free-for-all in this regard, but I think John did a great job in continuing to point the court to all of its earlier cases where they you know, provide full protection to um, offensive speech, hateful speech, and that that's kind of the, you know, that's the, the feature of our, of our system in, in the United States. And so that they were uncomfortable with it did surprise me because all of those justices have joined most, if not or many of those opinions, and as recently as two years ago. So I, I agree with Jeremy, though. I think when they get back and really start working through this and um, reminding themselves of what they've written and joined previously, that it might um, be simpler for them. But um, I was surprised that it wasn't more, like Ilya said, what is distinguishing this case from Tam. I, I initially thought, we discussed, Christine, this morning in line, that maybe this was, cert was granted because you know, at the time TAM was decided, they only had an eight justice court, so we had two opinions. So it's not entirely clear which is exactly the controlling opinion from TAM because we had four and four. Um, so I thought maybe it was just an opportunity to have a very clear majority one way or another um, in dealing with this, this context, but, but maybe, maybe not. Time will tell. Mr. Davis? So I did not receive a summary from my cab driver on the way to the court this morning, so I'm going to be a little more long-winded. Uh, I also was surprised at the extent to which uh, the court did not seem uh, to think that, uh, or the court thought that, that TAM might not be relevant to its disposition of the constitutionality of this particular prohibition on their face. The prohibitions are similar. Uh, the court seemed to have set up in TAM through those two four justice opinions, a, a rubric uh, pursuant to which you look at viewpoint, the viewpoint discriminatory effect of the government action, uh, in which case you know where that's going to go. Uh, there's a suggestion that if it's only content discriminatory, uh, you go with Central Hudson, although it's tough to figure out what, might, what Justice Alito might have meant in TAM. But nonetheless, TAM just did not crop up 
in this discussion in the way uh, this morning that, that I would have thought it would. And I found that somewhat surprising. The other thing I found surprising was um, Justice Breyer's uh, belated discomfort with the prospect of some of these marks being registered. His, he was preoccupied with the possibility of, of, regist- of the registrability of marks that caused I think, as he put it, a, a physiological reaction well, in people, three or four times. Um, <laughs> which he feels can be measured empirically or scientifically somehow. Uh, it seems that if he if he was to bring up this concern, if this was a concern, that TAM would have been the more appropriate case in which to raise it, and not this case two years later. Um, so, of course, Mr. Summer is going to say he wasn't surprised by anything. He was prepared for everything that came up, but. <laughs> Well, I was surprised I didn't screw up. Because <laughs> that was actually my only goal. Because, for first of all, if it's 8-0 in the TAM case, you assume that we have a pretty good chance of winning. So my goal really was not to screw up. But I also didn't want to give away anything that was critical. So, but you, that, was the, that, the, that was the line of questions that you thought you were going to get? Well, uh, you know, again, you'll hear me. The thing I tell the law students is preparation, preparation. And I did four moots, and all of them were useful. Uh, the last one, I think, was, uh, made me sort of feel a little more comfortable because I did a pretty good job. But on all the other three, there were significant issues and problems. And so, but because I had discovered them ahead of time, because despite living with the case for uh, literally eight years, there's still things I hadn't thought through completely. Um, and like one of the big issues was, I, in my brief, I said profanity always expresses viewpoint, in which case you cannot prohibit it from being on the side of the bus. And so I knew that would be a problem for the judges and the justices. And also preparation, because I was aware of the, uh, the there's a case that the court has asked for more briefing before decide, deciding to grant cert. And I thought that Justice Kagan was going to give me some grief about that. And I said, you know, in effect, you guys are likely to decide that. And if you don't know yet, how am I expected to know? Because I think he, I, I thought I felt very good vibes when I said, you know, you, that's pending for cert. So um, I'm, I'm tempted to pull a McLaughlin group line here and say who's right and who's wrong and your surprises, but my students won't get the reference, so I'll pass on that. <laughs> um, so I, I would say uh, right off the bat, the thing that, that I found most surprising um, was the Deputy um, Solicitor General's opening and theme, which is we're going to, and I, I wrote down his line, going forward, uh, going forward, we're going to apply the statute differently. Um, which was a new take that hadn't appeared in either of their briefs. Um, and I think that Justice Kagan in particular was really on that and, and having a problem with that being um, uh, the first time <laughs> that she'd heard this. And she asked a number of pointed questions about, well, what exactly does this mean? And other justices asked questions about, you know, kind of focusing on this is a facial challenge. What does it mean that this is a facial challenge to the statute? Um, so, so on that, um, on those exchanges, and there were many, um, you know, what does the statute say? What does it mean that it's a facial challenge? And what did the Deputy Solicitor General say would be the going forward approach to, the, to that standard? Anybody want to comment? I'd like to comment on what a disaster I think that would be. Can I comment? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I think as, as someone who's been um, kind of a student of this provision for a long time and finding in particular the inconsistencies that have existed in the application of this particular statute over time, depending examiner to examiner, um, reasoning to reasoning, it's incredibly problematic. And I left today thinking, wow, I didn't think this, this statute could potentially be applied in, in worse ways, um, but perhaps it can. So a couple of examples. One, thinking about you know, applying it in, in a narrower way, but having no guidance on what that would actually mean seems very difficult um, for a scheme that relies on the trademark examination system as it's set up. Then with Justice Breyer's um, thinking about 
returning to this kind of physiological response, we see individual examiners making these decisions largely in isolation on individuals thinking about way, you know, terms that might or marks that might shock the conscience, might offend. Um, and, and because that is a, a, a personal feeling, we end up with these consistencies. But if we're moving to some kind of physiological response of a, a brain scan of, of trademark examiners, it just seems like there's no way to actually make that. It adds another X factor to me. There's no way to kind of make that more objective. And as much as the justices were probing in different directions, I don't think any of these directions would actually result in the kind of objectivity that I felt like was so desperately wanted throughout the course of of the arguments. Um, uh, but, uh, and I would just add, I, I think that this was um, maybe the weakest point in a not terribly strong presentation by the government uh, because um, uh, the government's uh, argument today was sort of trust us. Um, you know, in, inside uh, the uh, halls of the PTO, uh, we're going to apply some new approach, which we haven't publicly promulgated or invited comment on, um, and which uh, they did not today do a particularly good job of even explaining what it was going to be. Uh, the emphasis seemed to be on two factors. First, that it would be um, the restriction going forward would be more focused on a sort of a smaller universe of words, maybe just sort of profane, vulgar words, as opposed to words that have the broader, you know, to be seen as immoral or scandalous, um, and also that the focus would be on mode of expression rather than content. And I heard that over and over today, and each time I didn't know what it meant. Um, uh, so, you know, my personal sympathy is the government lawyer. I think he had a difficult position. He did a nice job with it. Um, but uh, Justice Kagan's response, and I, I wrote this down in quotation marks in my notes today, what are we supposed to be doing here, she said. And she said it with what seemed to me to be genuine exasperation uh, with the government uh, that they would sort of walk into the Supreme Court and say, hey, let's sort of, you know, let's rewrite the statute here and now. Anyone else? Just add something real quick. As I thought about it this afternoon, I think I ultimately got to a point where I think that there, the government's lack of consistency already in in either registering or rejecting marks is ultimately going to doom their their case here. But I think because of that history, there is no way the court is going to seriously take their promises that it's going to be better in the future because there just is no track record of um, of legitimacy there. Yeah, that, that's why this was referenced. You have that uh, page in the in the red brief. The uh, the uh, well, your brief. Uh, with the uh, different uh, bad words and uh, occasions in which they were registered and weren't registered. Uh, it was reminiscent of, uh, I think, Lisa Blatt's brief in the TAM case where it was just pages and pages and pages of seemingly disparaging epithets that had been registered. And so what are you doing uh, now? So I, I, however they decide this, I don't think it's going to be, well, the government has assured us uh, and therefore, we'll be looking at it to make sure that they've properly narrowed everything. I, I don't think that's the, the standard they're going to rely on. Yeah, for, the, for those who, who haven't seen uh, what we're talking about, and you're welcome to come up and look at it afterwards. This is you're the, not going to read it? The, uh, <laughs> hey, you know, I, I personally, I thought it was odd, actually genuinely odd, that, that uh, the words weren't spoken in open court today. I mean, the trademark is fucked, you know? Uh, and that's fine. And, uh, and I think... And we almost do a disservice to the First Amendment by, you know, dancing around the word um, and giving it, uh, you know, sort of giving undue respect to the the uh, negative power that people seem to attribute to it. But uh, well, anyway, I have to jump in on that. I did that in my Georgetown uh, uh, moot, and I got such bad feedback from all the justices. And I went back and I read uh, Mel Nimmer's argument and Cohen. And originally, I wasn't going to use them. And I'm glad that I got that bad feedback because it made it absolutely clear I wasn't going to use them because I think that would have just annoyed Roberts to no end. Oh, no, and, and to be clear, I, um, what we, we did in our brief, many people did in their briefs, uh, was uh, go through these sort of long the words. And the appendix from John's brief, he took the George Carlin and dirty words and the results of a Wikipedia search for profane words um, and then sort of charted out uh, which ones the trademark office has allowed and which ones they have not, 
And as Justice Gorsuch said this morning, he said, I can't find a rational line through here. Can you, to the lawyer, and the lawyer could not. Um, so um, <clears throat> the Washington Post said the briefing in this case says, you know, more profanity frat party. Um, Guilty. <laughs> Guilty. Uh, we, we had a lot of fun with it uh, in our office. Um, but uh, the, and I would commend to you in particular, there's a spectacular amicus brief uh, from uh, Professors Beebe and Frommer, uh, where they did a massive empirical study um, of uh, which trademarks the office is allowed and which trademarks they not. They, they really have put an end to any uh, factual question as to whether the trademark office has taken a coherent approach and demonstrated beyond a doubt empirically that the trademark office is fatally incoherent on this stuff. So I I, we don't have anybody from the government here, although they were invited. Um, but so, and I feel uh, I feel somewhat responsible to articulate the viewpoint on behalf of the government. Um, I, I would not say that it's accurate to say that the government had no response to that very pointed question from Justice Gorsuch. The response given to Justice Gorsuch and to Justice Kavanaugh and to the extent Justice Ginsburg asked the same question, which is, what about the inconsistency? What are you going to do about it? Um, I think the response consistently was, because of the nature of trademark examination, where we're always examining things in a context, it will necessarily lead to different results. And I didn't at least see any of the justices push back on that. I don't know whether they accepted that, um, but, but th there wasn't follow-up questions to that. So I think, I think that was the answer that, you know, given the context, given the, what the mark is being applied to, given what other um, words are surrounding that word, in fact, you have examples where there's a, a totally different meaning that emerges um, from something which sounds like the mark involved in this case. Um, that, I think that only applies to, to one line of cases. You interpret this statute, you've got a whole line of cases um, that are decided under a, a per se interpretation of the mark without reference to the goods or services. And one of the oddities of Section 2A that distinguishes it from some of the other subsections of Section 2 is the state, this, this particular subsection does not expressly require a comparison of the mark in the context of, you know, with its goods and services the way the other subsections of Section 2 do. But the office has adopted a, a, a two-fold approach to this. There are some marks, and this was the analysis applied to Mr. Bernani's mark in this case, um, the mark is, is unregisterable per se. The goods and services don't come into play, uh, and here the goods and services are, are innocuous, the clothing. And then there's a separate line of cases in which the mark becomes unregisterable only because of the goods and services with which it's associated. And then there's a few, far smaller number of cases in which the mark suddenly becomes more acceptable when you take into account the goods and services with which it's used. So it's the, the government's argument on that point isn't quite accurate. It captures only half the cases out there. It doesn't capture the, the other half in which the Patent and Trademark Office looks at the mark and says, that's it, we're not going to go any further. Yeah, and what's interesting is um, the, the government takes a consistent approach to all of the provisions in, in Section 2 in that regard in terms of n none of them are purely examined in the abstract, right? To, to some extent, they're contextualized at least within the mark, right? Not necessarily to the goods or services they're applied to, but it doesn't need to be that way. Um, and so when the government was explaining its, its new method going forward and limiting, it could have limited it in this regard, right? It could have said, with regard to this particular provision, in future, we're not going to contextualize that, and that will deal with the problem that you have with inconsistency to a large extent. Yeah, and I, and I, I misspoke just a second ago. There are other provisions of Section 2 that you don't have that goods and services, uh, you don't take into account the goods and services. So, for example, uh, Section 2C, you're registering somebody else's personal name. The, the, um, that prohibition does not depend on the goods and services, and neither does Section 2B, registration on, say, uh, the flags of, of different countries or municipal seals, that sort of thing. So with some of these prohibitions, Congress did expressly include, you did expressly mandate to, you take into account the goods and services 
being sold under the mark, but in others, you don't. In Section 2A, there is no such comparison required by the statute. So we didn't, it, uh, Mr. Trotter already mentioned, we didn't, we didn't get any insight as to commercial speech. Um, there was some little discussion about government program. Anyone learn anything new or have any ideas about what, if anything, the court will say about whether this is a government benefits program? Uh, I'll take first crack. Uh, I mean, this is also something we all, I think, felt was uh, pretty much a dead letter after TAM, um, where it seemed clear from that decision that any suggestion that a trademark is a form of government speech or that the government has its own sort of independent interest in not associating the government imprimatur with the, the provocative mark, uh, we thought those, those issues had been put to rest by TAM. Not everything was, but that one we thought clearly was. Uh, and the government tried to sort of breathe some new life into those arguments today. Um, there were multiple questions to the government lawyer asking, what is the government interest here? Uh, I, for one, heard, uh, I thought, you know, two attempts to answer that question. One was that the government um, has an interest in uh, protecting the unwilling viewer. Uh, they contrasted this to the Carlin case where, you know, you'd have to actually go find Mr. Carlin's performance here. You, you know, you might see the, the trademark coming at you down a public street or in a shopping mall or on the side of a bus. Um, and also um, that the government uh, has an interest in sort of uh, discouraging or disincentivizing uh, the use of language like this. Um, I didn't think either of those uh, arguments got a lot of traction with the court, but those were, were the efforts anyway, I think. And, and I think one other, which was proposed by Justice Alito, I think it was, um, which is the government may want to distance itself from certain words. So I think it wasn't it Justice Alito who, who posed this question very starkly. Is it A or is it B? Do you want to distance yourself from these kinds of words? Or do you want to protect the public? Yeah, I, I view that as sort of the flip side of the, dis the disincentivizing point. But you're right that he, he did put it that way. And yeah. then Justice so. um, Sotomayor said, why are you resisting? Why, you know, why, why don't you just bail on protecting the public? The mark is out there anyway. The mark is still in the mall. The mark is still on the side of the bus. So why are you hanging on to that as a government interest? I did think, if, if I could, one very um, kind of lively moment in, in the argument, Justice Roberts was trying to spin out a scenario of the, the mother sort of walking her children through the mall. Um, a big issue in this case is whether the trademark really is a government imprimatur. Uh, and whether that's a legitimate interest. And he, he pictures the mother just trying to sort of- I didn't hear mother. She, she, uh, mother, parent? Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> may, maybe I misheard, or maybe I'm assuming that Justice Roberts was assuming. Uh, in, in any event, so uh, adult is walking the mall with the children, and oh, look at that word on the tree. Oh, oh no, it has a, a TM next to it. And then he stops and says, oh, they're not going to say that. And the whole court burst into laughter. Um, and I, I think that's, that's a telling moment. Because I think it, you know, it captures actually a very strong common intuition uh, that this argument, this is a form of government speech or imprimatur, really just that dog won't hunt. But, and I'm sorry to just, uh, feel free to jump in and stop me, but, but he did say in that, in that exchange, he did say if, you know, to this problem of the unwilling um, uh, listener viewer in the mall, um, that if the government would grant registrations in these marks, it would encourage these marks because there would be, people would make a bigger, there would be a, a more, I forget how he put it, a, a more commercial investment. So he did seem to intuit in his question that without um, this government benefit, there would, in fact, be less of these marks in the marketplace. That is the, the floodgates problem that I referenced in my opening comments. You're absolutely right. How true is that? I'm, you know, I'm not an IP guy. I'm a simple constitutional lawyer, so I don't know whether Eric or the, oh, the IP. Yeah. I'll question it. Um, it. It may not be the case. Uh, having a registration is a very powerful offensive weapon in litigation to protect the mark. Uh, not having a registration, as you've heard, does prevent you from availing yourself of the federal anti-counterfeiting remedies that otherwise are available to registrants. If the, if the mark owner cannot go after counterfeits under federal law, uh, it may be the case that denying registration leads to more instances of the mark appearing in the marketplace where it can be encountered by members of the public. 
Well, one thing, again, I keep on saying for you, the law students, is preparation. And one of the things, I've read the biographies of several of the justices, and one thing I noticed about Sotomayor is she was going after counterfeiters in Canal Street. It's like, ding, 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 ding. So that's why I put in my brief, one of the problems of not having a registration is you can't go get the police to go after counterfeiters. And she didn't mention anything about that, but I'm sure she remembered when she read the brief. Yeah, I used to do that. <laughs> So, um, uh, so many, so many questions in so little time. Um, I think um, somebody mentioned what the we were just talking about the, what the government's interest is. Um, any sense that the government's interest in this provision would survive either strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny, based on that exchange? I I don't think so, and. and Going back to Tam in the Kennedy opinion, it says that it recognizes the court's cases have long prohibited the government from justifying a First Amendment burden by pointing to the offensiveness of the speech to be suppressed. And by using you know, the view of what's the unsuspecting audience um, going to think about this, I mean, that, that's just when they start writing the opinion, it's, it's not, going to, not going to hold up. I, I agree. You're not only going to have to distinguish TAM, you're going to have to distinguish a whole slew of prior decisions by the court saying offensiveness is just not enough. Um, I found it, uh, John, your answer at a certain point uh, in the argument where you said obscenity. So what is the government's interest in uh, regulating or restricting things that don't meet that standard? Uh, and I think, I think Breyer even said at some point, some of these racial slurs or epithets that we said could be registered in TAM are more offensive or, or, or could be, uh, or have more of an impact or more scandalous than these so-called purely scandalous uh, swear words or, or what have you. But that you know, the response on obscenity, I thought, was, was very good. I have by the way, anytime you have anything that I did bad or I get a bad answer, that's what I'm most interested in hearing. <laughs> <laughs> I found myself wondering, and, and a, a question I would love to get other thoughts on, I found myself questioning whether or not the court was revisiting or questioning some of its yeah. dis, the TAM decision, or whether they legitimately feel like there is a distinction here because the arguments were, were different and the opinion certainly in TAM would not have led to the discussion naturally that we saw today. So do you, do you think that they were kind of regretting TAM or do you think that it's, they were just legitimately thinking it was a diff, it's a different animal? Hey, I'm supposed to ask the question. I'm sorry. It's <laughs> <laughs> an excellent question. <laughs> What do you think? I, I, I think it's, well, I think that, um, so I, I think you're exactly, your, 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 your observation is exactly right. Um, I've been at the court when there has been a situation like this where an earlier decision is kind of up for grabs, and the author of that decision has been very aggressively defensive of what that decision says and, and that it stands. And here, in particular, Alito was really revealing, and this was already mentioned, when I think, um, uh, John, you said, um, well, Tam held that offensiveness is a viewpoint, right? And, and he interrupted and said, well, no, in that case, the mark was expressing an idea. So that, that was the opposite of what I expected him in particular to be saying in this oral argument, that seemed to maybe not regret the, the decision, but so much as just see it as uh, this, is, this is a totally different case. Well, see, that's the one thing I was wondering if uh, they were saying because Tam is different because he's trying to reclaim the trademark, but that's not what the court held. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it didn't matter that he's trying to reclaim it. Right. But now they're saying, like, maybe that made a difference. Right. And, that's, and that was... Um, Justice Breyer saying, well, that was an ironic, ironic. <laughs> that was an ironic use, as if that was a, a wholly other matter. Yeah. Other, other views on this? What, 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 what was the court doing? Was it regretting its, uh, dis any part of its decision and uh, opinion in TAM? 
Uh, I think um, I didn't. I didn't feel hearing regret. I, I thought I heard a genuine sort of you know working through of, of where the limits are. There was also um, active discussion, for example, of how the PTO is currently handling applications uh, for marks that are racially disparaging. Um, and uh, what the government lawyer said is they're you know, generally allowing them to go through in light of TAM, but they're holding in abeyance uh, registrations for what he characterized as the sort of the, the core, you know, offensive racial term, uh, which was not spoken in court. Um, so, uh, you know, and Alito seemed in particular to be wrestling with the possibility that when it comes to the words that are covered by Section 2A, but not by the disparaging provision, yeah, he suggested that these words might not be expressing ideas, that they're just kind of a shout, a, call, a cry for attention, hey, look at me. Um, and if that's if the court were to decide that's a meaningful distinction, then there's room to you know, distinguish TAM, if not cover it back. I, I don't think that's where they're going to wind up, but I think that's just the issue they're sort of working through or playing with. Any other, uh, any other viewpoints on whether this is viewpoint discriminatory? I, 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 somebody said I thought that was going to be the, the bulk of the, the time spent arguing whether, um, whether uh, scandalous and immoral was viewpoint discrim discrimination or not. And there was some exchange about it, although it wasn't the sole focus of, of the argument. Did we, did we learn anything from what was, at least what was asked by the justices about what their, what their view today of viewpoint discriminate? discrimination entails? Well, this is actually sort of a different subject, but it reminded me, I was very shocked at the end when I was asking this, either Sotomayor or Breyer, someone that side of the bench, asked, well, what's the standard? And it was like, uh, sort of, uh, he or she was implying, you know, it was like a vagueness challenge. And it's like, I, I thought they knew constitutional law better than me, and it's an overbreath challenge. And uh, because it doesn't matter what Brunetti's mark is. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember who said that, but I was very shocked because I didn't think I was I, supposed to be teaching yeah, them con law. Yeah. I, I had an idea when Justice Alito said in, in response with your point on TAM that, well, that was expressing an idea. I don't want to put Mr. Brunetti on the spot here, but I, I had to step back for a minute and think that, well, I'm sure you did have an idea when you originally <laughs> yeah. came up with this mark and that that doesn't really make much sense to me. But in any event, if the court is looking at the subjective intent of the registrant with the mark and that Simon Tam's intent was noble and this may be less so, uh, that's just going to make this problem even worse because then we're doubling the subjectivity in, in this calculus. Mr. Brunetti, can you tell us about what uh, does, is this a mark that, that expresses an idea, do you think? Uh, the question everybody wanted the answer to. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a, I was explaining to John the other day on the phone that it's, it's more of, it's, it's a paradox. And the, the reason that when I, when we created the brand, it, we were originally, it was a design, a graphic design firm. So if you look at our logo, it's, you know, it's very corporate and very you know, non-assuming and very official looking which was the reason we, we, we did that deliberately. And we, we didn't want to call the brand fucked and have it like scratched in blood or something because that, that's, there's, it doesn't create any sort of dialogue with the, with the viewer or the consumer. We wanted it to be sort of um, uh, un, very unassuming so that the person that was looking at it is immediately says in their mind or out loud, does that say what I think it says? Or how do you pronounce that? So when we created it, we were aware of that, yes. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that's an actual idea, per se. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, somebody has already alluded to this. It was uh, one of the surprises you mentioned was that um, this bench, and especially some of the particular justices on the bench, seemed to be in a place where they thought it might be okay in some world. I mean, it might be okay. There, there might be a statute which prohibits registration of certain marks, right? And there was frequent mention to vulgarity, profanity, and sexual explicitness. Um, 
do you think there, if, if, this, if this court were going to redraft the statute, do, what do you think they would be comfortable prohibiting, if anything? They t I'll take it at first and then um, pass it along. But I, the, one of the things that kept coming up was some sort of list. Yeah. And that reminds me, honestly, of being, a, when I was a child, my mother decided that we all were saying too many bad words. So she had a list of words that any time my brother or sister or I said any of the, called each other usually, one of these words, we'd have to put a quarter in a jar. And so, you know, for a while, the jar started to get some substantial quarters in it. But then we realized we could insult each other by being so creative that we, we didn't have to use any one of those, you know, 10 words on the list we could get our point across and get, uh, get it across very effectively. Um, so that kind of reasoning is sort of what I think about when we think about you know, having some kind of list. And it, it, if you look at the George Carlin seven dirty words, it's the same sort of thing where you think, wow, those are the seven. Um, you know, shit is on there. But I wouldn't put that as maybe one of the top seven. And I think that really highlights some of the core problems of this provision, which is that Everybody's perspective of what's scandalous or especially what's immoral is going to change, and then our cultural norms are going to significantly shift over time. So, a well, hundred years ago, damn would be one of the top few. Yeah, or I mean, back when the the statute was first enacted in the the Lanham Act, you know, Queen Mary for underwear was rejected, um, Madonna for wine was rejected, and even then, in the opinion about Madonna for wine, you see on one hand, people are saying. Uh, you know, the, the, the court says in the opinion, well, you know, Madonna is this image, this purest image of womanhood. And then on the other hand, um, wine is mentioned a lot in the Bible. So you see this kind of contradictory reasoning that, that comes out from the very beginning of, of the Lanham Act provision that we're, we're talking about today. Yeah, that, those cases came from 1938, and they actually predate the Act. So this, this oh, provision yeah, comes from Section 5 of the 1905 Act. Mm -hmm. But those examples demonstrate why this is a viewpoint discriminatory uh, provision and how the PTO has always applied it that way. Um, because in both of those cases, uh, the P it's the PTO on one hand and the Court of Customs and Patent Appeals, and the other go out of their way to say there is nothing inherently wrong with the Queen Mary mark. But when you use it as a trademark for women's undergarments, all of a sudden, now that's, that's something terrible. The same thing with Madonna. And you're right, most of that opinion is setting up you know, this word as the, the, you know, the absolute purest word in the English language. It only becomes scandalous and immoral when you use it as a trademark for wine. And so you have, you, you have a, the phenomenon of the office not just regulating all uses of Queen Mary, all uses of Madonna, but only certain ones. And that's what I think takes this prohibition outside the scope of content discrimination, which would be the case if you have just a list of words that are unregisterable in any context, and into viewpoint discrimination in which the government is affirmatively picking and choosing what it's going to approve based on something, you know, something, uh, it, it's not, it's not, again, not attempting to regulate all uses of it. And you'll see that in modern interpretations as well. The old glory condom case uh, from 1993, this is an application to register that mark, Old Glory Condom Corporation for condoms. And one of the reasons why the Trademark Trial Appeal Board reversed the refusal to register is because it approved of the applicant's message. That message was, a, at the time, it's everyone's patriotic duty to use condoms. And the board said, we're impressed with the seriousness of purpose of this applicant. And there you've got the flip side of it. You've got what might be an unregisterable mark suddenly becoming registrable because the office approves of the message of it. And again, that's the essence of viewpoint discrimination. And then if we stick with just the list of certain words and keep it in any circumstance, I can't imagine that they would do that because then we're square into content-based discrimination. And the only interests the government's going to be able to articulate are the ones that we've already discussed before that is really I can't see working. And so I, I can't imagine the court trying to separate out 
um, and say, well, only these specific words are going to be scandalous and, and unregisterable. And at the same time, I was going to say, or if Congress acts on that suggestion, is, is, does Congress have the self-restraint to limit itself to 12 words or seven words, you know, whatever Carlin used? And if you have a list, then you're just going to have, like Eric, uh, spoonerisms and misspellings and homonyms and all sorts of things like, uh, like that. Uh, um, there's not going to be, like, like, like you said, man, the uh, creativity to, to rephrase and, and reframe. So you're not exactly hitting the list, but you're close enough. In fact, this happened to me inadvertently. I thought I swore that I heard and I wrote down that at the end... Uh, of your argument, John, that the Chief Justice asked, can you trademark F-U-C-K? He didn't say that. He said, can you trademark the actual uh, homonym for the Bulgari that we've been talking about or something like that? And I wrote down, can you trademark F-U-C-K? And I heard that. And I later blogged it. But no, it's just because it was so evocative that my mind interpolated the exact meaning, which is exactly what you're going for when you're trying to be edgy and whatnot. I was surprised that I got a lot of blowback from that from, I think it was Alito, when I said, you're still going to have to draw lines. And I, I got a very unfavorable feeling back. <laughs> well, I, I want you all to have time to ask questions. I'll just ask one last question before I turn it over to the audience. Uh, what will the justices say? Your predictions, please. And a thumbs up, thumbs down. Just, uh, well, I'd well, like more, but if you just do thumbs up, <laughs> thumbs down. I think they're going to strike it down. Uh, I think they're going to strike it down. I think they're going to decline to rewrite it. And I think they're going to continue to leave open, as they did in TAM, where this actually fits in First Amendment doctrine. They just know they don't like this, but they're going to uh, wash their hands as to um, actually giving us a rule. I think I agree with that. I don't know whether that means that they strike it down only as applied or kind of strike it down but have a lot of hand-waving, meaning, well, maybe in certain contexts. Uh, but I think, I think it's not going to be a, a complete um, win for either side. Yeah, I think it's struck down. I think there will be a number of separate opinions, though, some perhaps showing that they're striking it down begrudgingly, maybe a two-justice opinion saying, hey, this is America. We're, we're supposed to be able to say you know, what we want aside from the specific categories of unprotected speech. Uh, I, I think there will be kind of an effort to uh, distinguish it from, well, I hope not, to distinguish it from the Tam case and that you know, everyone liked Simon Tam and this marks a little different, but yeah, I, I, think, I think it's a win. The thought that just occurred to me as you were saying that how they could write this is they say they take John's obscenity, there's that, plus, as uh, I think has been discussed, how difficult it would be to just, you know, register a, a swear word that you actually have to use it or work it into something else. Um, so to kind of tighten in some standards for future um, examinations by the PTO officer with, who will no longer formally have this weapon. And I guess I will add, I don't expect there to be any lengthy, if any, analysis under the commercial speech doctrine, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I, I might even be surprised if they go so far as the Alito opinion did in TAM as to say if it, if it does apply, it can't even survive there. I, I think they may just not even get there and just focus on um, the viewpoint discrimination base. But I can hope that we can have a, an expounded discussion on the commercial speech doctrine and that it should be no more going forward. I also think it'll be struck down. I think what is difficult to predict, though, is the model the court will use if indeed there is an opinion of the court uh, to get to that result. I remain optimistic. So. <laughs> I think uh, it, after the ar I thought it was would have, my opinion changed a lot after the argument, and I think it may be very a short opinion that says this statute is way too broad, and we're not going to decide anything else. And as long as I had the mic, I had to say that Megan Carper did, did the yeoman's work with her article NWSF, and uh, because she did it the hard way, and then uh, the uh, BB and Frommer did. Uh, uh, had much more resources at their 
uh, availability, so they did write a very great brief. But Megan's the one who deserves all the kudos. <laughs> great. Thanks, John. <laughs> Questions from the audience? We have a microphone here. Please don't be shy. Well, before you ask, uh, did anyone sort of get one? Because I was prepared for what other parts of the statute might be constitutional, unconstitutional. And I believe I said dump the governor. Did I, did I say that? Yeah, and you mentioned 2B and 2C in particular. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But I think everyone knew what I was talking about, but I didn't want to say. <laughs> Do you want to come up to the microphone just because we're um, making a webcast and we can hear you better? And others, prepare your question. Looking at you guys. One of the things in watching the argument, and watching the justices, it, and this was one of the things that was difficult about it because they were afraid to say words. But I, I really got the sense that they weren't ready to open up the N word to, right. to complete free for all and that they really felt that there should be a limit. And I kept hearing that question, where should we draw the line? And it wasn't, we don't need a line here, we can throw this entirely out. And I really felt that a majority of the justices did not want to see trademarks of the N-word. And that, I, I felt that that was a major sort of unsaid factor in that. And I was curious as if other people read that the same way. They don't want to hear that. I heard that too. Um, and, I, and I think that complicates your predictions. Um, and you know, it wouldn't be the first time that the court um, certified a particular question, right? This was a facial challenge of the statute um, and maybe gave an answer that drifted a little bit from the question that was certified. So it was Chief Justice Roberts who asked you, I think John, like, three or four times in a row, so this is a facial challenge. Wasn't it, wasn't it to John? So, so this is a facial challenge. This is a facial challenge. Um, it could be that they say uh, that it, as applied, it's unconstitutional, and it, it needs to be um, narrowed in some way that they're not going to solve for you, although uh, Justice Gorsuch said, you know, of course we could solve the problem for you, but uh, you should solve it. Uh, so it, it, you know, that that I think that's a possibility. What what do the rest of you think? That's that's one of the things that troubles me about the question of kind of revisiting TAM versus this is something different because that seems to me to be the mo the more appropriate time for that concern to arise. Mm -hmm given that we're talking about disparaging speech? Well, I think there's a difference of opinion. I, I think there's a broad difference of opinion whether that word is obscene, disparaging, something else, has a viewpoint, right? I, I don't think, I don't think well, that maybe there's the patent, an agreement. Maybe the trademark examiners will have to convene a focus group and hook them up to a uh, skin uh, uh, conduction <laughs> machine so Justice Breyer can conduct his experiment about whether something is show, so shocking to uh, elevate the pulse rate and conduct your skin in different ways and whatnot. Well, I think what, what Breyer's questions were sort of um, moving towards, and maybe awkwardly, um, was uh, trying to find the right First Amendment box for this stuff, OK? So if it's viewpoint discriminatory, um, if it's content-based, you know, then we're clearly talking about you know, sort of follow your flow chart. You know, everyone who's taken First Amendment law, you know, you're moving towards strict scrutiny. Or if you're saying it's commercial speech, you're moving towards Central Hudson. Breyer was suggesting that maybe we can begin to move this stuff um, towards maybe a more generous definition of obscenity. He even suggested a more generous definition of fighting words. Put it in one of those categories that the court has historically said is completely outside the First Amendment. Uh, then you know, it's sort of you know open season for restriction and regulation. Um, so uh, I agree with the questioner that there is great discomfort uh, about uh, the N-word. Mr. Stewart's comments about how the PTO is currently approaching that or is indicative of that. Um, and I think that just, uh, uh, that pushes us towards, uh, I think it was, said, yeah, we're going to get a short opinion that says that this statute as written is overbroad, this uh, rejection of this trademark is impermissible. 
um, and sort of dangle an invitation to Congress to try again rather than give us uh, a detailed doctrinal roadmap here. I think they'll find that simply too hard on these facts. Anyone else? No? If we work under the assumption that it is struck down, any predictions on how Congress might react, if at all? Well, I'm the last person, you know, because I'm not a DC person. Um, but uh, one of uh, someone I was talking to about, because my goal is to get Eric's mark registered, not just to have Congress write a new statute. And I guess what I was told, and I sort of assumed to be true, Congress can't pass anything nowadays. <laughs> I think it might open the door to more time, place, manner regulations of the sort that the the bus advertising hypothetical raised. So. Even if you have the purest, cleanest speech, Madonna and whatnot, uh, you can't blast that out uh, from a megaphone in the residential neighborhood in the middle of the night, right? Um, so similarly, you can get your trademark registered, but that's a separate question of whether you can get plaster that trademark on a billboard across from a school or, or a bus or whatever. Yeah, there haven't been any moves of which I'm aware to undo TAM legislatively. People have talked about it, but uh, there doesn't seem to be much momentum behind that. And of course, you, you've also got the possibility of uh, what to do, or you also have the issue of what to do with the Model State Trademark Act, uh, which has a similar prohibition at the state level. And you're, you'll throw it open to all the general assemblies across the country to try and do something about it. If there is, a, if the court's opinion allows for a legislative fix, assuming there's invalidation here. Just to, um, as a shameless plug, I, I published an article called Contextual Healing that looks at some of these um, issues of time, place, manner, and trying to place scandalous and immoral trademarks in the broader context of, of obscenity. And I think that that could be an option. Just pointing out the Marvin Gaye estate has shown itself to be very litigious. <laughs> So just for a moment, forget the justices, forget Congress. How would you change the Trademark Act? <laughs> it's hard to get this many No, really, you quiet. have to yeah. have answers. I mean, we've all, it, it seems everyone, including the justices and all of you, agree that this statute is too vague um, and too difficult to apply in any reasonably um, non-arbitrary way. So what do we do? And the second part is, under that rubric, do we register this trademark or not? I think you strike down Section 2A. I think you register this trademark. And I think, um, you know, I, I do not personally have in mind a replacement law that solves for the uh, problems the justices imagined uh, this morning. Uh, I think that you know, core principles of trademark law are going to take care of the overwhelming majority of the uh, what seemed to the justices to be the problematic cases. That is, that you know, under you know ordinary principles of showing actual source identification, uh, you know, a source identifying function uh, to consumers. That you know, most of the words that we're worried about here are likely just not going to be registrable. And I agree with that. And to bring it back to why I'm here, commercial speech, and why I don't think it applies in this case is because the reasons why um, commercial speech, properly defined, is given lesser scrutiny than strict scrutiny is because the government has an interest in preventing fraud and consumer confusion and things of that nature, but the, the trademark laws as they are absent the challenge provisions here in TAM already account for those problems and actually granting trademarks solve those potential problems. So I'm, I'm quite happy with those aspects of the trademark law because they make it unnecessary for the commercial speech doctrine to even apply in instances such as this. Yeah, I don't know if your question was limited to section two. If Congress would let me, I'd rewrite all sorts of stuff in the Lanham Act. <laughs> I wouldn't stop with it. But I'd, I'd start with getting, getting that, these, this language out. But I would also go through and get rid of the special protection for uh, marks like the U.S. Olympic Committee's marks, you know, things for which there's no basis. But my, my general philosophy is if, it if, it's, if it's a mark, meaning it's non-distinct, it's distinctive, it's non-functional, it's used in commerce, it ought to qualify for registration. If the statute falls, then yes. 
So I, I think there's a, a much and, and bigger. The I, I think the statute has fallen as to that mark in TAM. Yeah. I mean, I, that's that's why I'm surprised Justice Justice Breyer has has come up with his belated concern two years later, and maybe he's reconsidering. Um, and we we certainly see this in the trademark world with uh, the Walmart case after two pesos a decade before, but when when the court stepped back and said this really isn't what we meant. So we're going to have a tertium quid. Yeah, tertium quid. Yeah, of course. <laughs> So I think there, there, are, there are bigger questions here in terms of rewriting the Trademark Act. One question is, what kind of public policy do we want this Trademark Act to do besides just regulating these core functions of protecting against some kind of deception? Because we have disparagement, scandalous immorality, and then we have this protection of flags and state emblems, which doesn't really relate to the core function of trademark protection. And we have this protection of... Uh, names and portraits, which also doesn't relate. So those those are bringing the these the public policy a little broader. Do we want to scrap all of that? And then we have these questions about depending on what the justice is right in this opinion, there are there could be other challenges down the road, First Amendment um, uh, uh, oriented challenges. Um, for instance, to dilution by tarnishment in particular could become vulnerable depending on what. Um, the justices say. So down the road, there may be some, you know, some hard thinking about what we want the Trademark Act to say in this age, given that it was basically drafted in 1933. Um, it's, it's an old act. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, regardless of whether or not Section 2 is struck down, there's still a little bit of ambiguity left over from TAM as, in terms of what is or is not registrable. And I was wondering, in all of your opinions, if you think this case, however it comes down, will open the door to the PTO maybe initiating a rulemaking proceeding to at least um, create some clarity for potential registrants about what is or is not potentially registrable. Uh, I'll try that one. Uh, no, um, I don't see a rulemaking in the cards. I think the PTO has shown over many years, as we've discussed, that it's incapable of bringing uh, clarity um, on these issues. I think clarity is not to be had. What we argued for uh, for INTA in our brief, and INTA is the trade organization for trademark owners, you know, all the major trademark owners globally in the U.S., over 7,000 of them, 190 countries um, uh, belong to INTA. Uh, is that above all, you need two things. You need clarity. That is, before you start investing in a mark, you need to have some understanding that it is or is not going to go through, and it's not going to be subject to the whim of an individual examiner. Uh, and you need uh, broad freedom, because consumer change, uh, public understanding of what marks are appealing, offensive, uh, workable commercially, not workable commercially change. Um, and uh, so the trademark owners need the ability to um, <coughs> uh, adjust um, and get their marks registered uh, in a predictable way. Um, I, I just don't see how the PTO uh, solves that problem through rulemaking, nor do I see them trying. I was just going through Lisa Blatt's brief. That's the, for the Redskins uh, in the TAM case. And there's a lot of really scandalous, or that you could argue are scandalous um, trademarks that have been registered. That was one of the things I did. I cited a lot of other briefs. I uh, cited Dykes on Bike. And, uh, and I just said, there's 18 pages in the brief in TAM, because I don't see any reason why I can't cite the briefs. You know, in this electronic day, the court has easy access to that. And I said, you know, those are really offensive. My client's trademark's not very offensive compared to those. One of the things that I think is it came up today as we think, and maybe this is just an obvious connection, but I, today I, I thought seriously about these two cases coming out differently. And then thinking about with the TAM case that disparaging marks would be fine, but then yeah. things that are scandalous and immoral in other ways would not be fine. I became very concerned suddenly about implications of racial issues and um, I, I don't know it just started to kind of boil up in my mind of thinking wait a second so anything that is disparaging of an individual or group could be registered but anything else you know and that could be that stuff that's scandalous or immoral um, but that Venn diagram wasn't sitting well with me yep. 
Hi. Um, it seems like the consensus of the panel, and forgive me if I'm wrong, is that the commercial speech versus strict scrutiny speech probably won't get that much devotion in the opinion, or they might try to um, find on other grounds. And so I'm wondering if, if that is the case, where do you think the, the next um, source of conflict over this uncertainty as to like the commercial speech or uh, strict scrutiny for trademarks will surface up again? Well, I'm not sure what other trademark cases that raise First Amendment issues may be percolating out there. Um, since I'm not exactly an intellectual property expert, but uh, there are cases all the time that do raise the issue of commercial speech. Does it get full sc strict scrutiny or not? And I th this would be a good topic for a, for a student note if someone's looking for one. A lot of cases, they come down like what happened in TAM. They, they say these are the differences, but we're not going to decide which one applies because no matter what you apply, the government loses. Well, there, it would be really interesting to see the difference between those cases and the ones where they, where there, it actually does make a difference. I had a case recently where won one claim but lost a claim under commercial speech, and I was frankly very surprised. Um, I'm ho hoping in one regard that the government appeals so I get a second crack of that at the Tenth Circuit, but uh, at least as far as I recall in my research, I, it's more often than not that they say it doesn't matter which one applies, the government's going to lose, but... Um, there are plenty of cases where the opportunity is there. Just aside from Justice Thomas, there's been nothing that I've seen. Now we have two new members of the court, but aside from, from him, none of them have said anything that I'm aware of showing a, an appetite for revisiting Central Hudson um, going forward. Um, we argued for Inta that uh, commercial speech uh, and Central Hudson is the right framework uh, because trademarks, um, although they may have ex uh, What's embodied in a trademark may also have an expressive component. What the trademark does is nothing other than propose the commercial transaction. The golden arches say, come buy my hamburger. The swoosh says, come buy my sneaker. Uh, the mouse ears say, come visit my theme park, et cetera. Um, so um, first, I think that's the right outcome. Uh, your question, you know, what's the case that's going to sort of you know, force the rubber to meet the road on this? I think you would probably, and I don't have a particular one in mind, that's percolating, but I think you would need a case involving a trademark that somehow managed to combine that source identification with a really pointed, expressive, uh, maybe political message. I was thinking political paraphernalia, or what about a, a band's artistic paraphernalia, right? The slants again. Right. right. Well, we have a reception waiting for you, so please join me in thanking this wonderful panel for all their insights. I do have uh, one thing I'll say. I think the next area is failure of function. I just think that's a ridiculous, it's just a bunch of different cases thrown together. And uh, I think that's going to be the next area that's coming up. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I'm so glad. Picture, picture the two of us together. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We never did get that. Well, you were so. consistent. Um, no, I'm so, I'm so delighted that you did this on. I know yeah, that yeah. a lot of. Uh, constraints and oh, obligations and all of that, a, so I'm delighted no that I would be trying to come to town. And if you ever come for an IPR, please let me know. I'll put you in the house. Delighted to have you there. Thank you so much. That was terrific. Thanks again for having me. Could you come down from here for just this? Yeah. 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 So I hope you guys will be um, open for some hard questions. Oh, really? Are you in the plan? Yeah, yeah. Okay. George? With a drink in the Oh, Bruce. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 okay, yeah. That's right, yeah. So uh, I had seen uh, by, uh, John, my brother, and uh, so I'm an engineer, so I just reading through briefs and things just for fun. And so you have a lot of perspective work with the organization. So we walked in late. I heard you being introduced. I thought, wow, what a coincidence. So <laughs> do, do you come here for this kind of uh, event, uh, for this kind of uh, argument uh, when this applies to your work? Yeah, I do. I do a lot of that. Thank you. Sorry about being late. Uh, 